Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I'm going to say, first off, I want to say uh, that, as Carol said, we got two programs tonight, and I'm going to try to work this down and, and talk heavy up front, show you a bunch of slides, essentially, and then towards the end, I'll, I'll kind of come in and talk a little bit, you know, a lot more. Um, you know, typically, this is like an hour program for me, and I'm going to try to bring it down to 30 minutes for us. So. I'm going to start off by saying that uh, this is a, a children's book that I was working on this last year, Big Ole and the Timber Mill Whistle in Bellingham. Um, I was uh, the writer and the illustrator, Ellen Clarks, from Bellingham. She's not here tonight. I was hoping she would. I haven't heard from her the past couple of days. Uh, and the story is based on a story from, of Ruth Talbra. Um, first of all, for anybody new here, is there anybody that does not know who Big Ole is? One. Two, okay, this is gonna be an easy crowd then. Um, so for a moment, let me just tell you about uh, where did Big Ole get his name? It was a whistle that was on the waterfront from 1899 till 1942. Well, I, I gotta tell you, uh, years and years ago I was doing research for the museum, going through newspapers, and I know somewhere in the first half of the last century I saw this, this article that said, uh, Ole, I mean, uh, whistle, giant whistle gets its name, and it was Big Ole, and it said that a uh, newspaper contest went out, and what are we going to name this this huge uh, whistle in town? And the and the paper said that the Scandinavians have taken over the name process, and they've decided on Big Ole. I have tried to find that again once I got interested in this, like a decade later. I don't know where it is. I asked Jeff Jewell about it the other day, and he says, well, an odd story is, as people have asked me, and I thought J.J. Donovan named it, but I don't remember where I saw that or where I read it or if I'm making it up. So that's out there somewhere. Um, so let me give you, uh, tell you what the book is about. Uh, I'm going to show you some images of the history of the time and everything that uh, what would have happened that the whistle had seen. Uh, but the book itself, it's a kid's story that uh, about a whistle, a big whistle that was on Bellingham Bayfront from the time period I described and overlooking Bellingham and its growth, looking at the forest and seeing the sailing ships coming in and his buddies, his pals, were the, the oxen and the horses, the little train that brought in the, uh, the logs and saying good morning to everybody coming into work. And it was, it's kind of a cutesy story. But what Big Ole is seeing while he's perched, you know, down at the, it's the uh, um, Blodow Donovan cargo mill is... He's realizing over time the forests are receding. They're going further back, and it's going faster and faster. And now he can hear his echo, and his echo's getting louder every year. And all of a sudden, he notices the oxen are gone, the, the, the horses are gone, and the little train, and the big logs are little logs. And the little sailing boats that came in and out are now these ugly steel ships. And now he's wondering to himself, what's going to happen to me? You know, am I becoming obsolete? Will I be in a trash heap someday? And that, that's the, the story. And where Ruth actually left off the story, and when I had seen it, was the logging industry goes bust. And he is taken down from his perch and loaded into a box. And the last words were, from the uh, owner of the mill who says, you're going up to Port Alberni and they need you up there. And he's kind of whimpering, you know, in his little box. And, and then uh, he says, Un until you're needed again. And Big Ole perks up and he goes, that's right. You know, the trees will grow back and they're going to need me once again and I'll be able to come back to Bellingham where I belong. 
So that's where the story was left. It was a cute little story. But anyways, three things that I want to try to cover rapidly for time is I'm going to show you some images over the course of this period. And I, some of them you've seen before, some of them are new that I found, but I kind of tried to line them up so you can see like a progression of change. And then I want to tell you about the rediscovery of Big Ole and what happened to him. And, uh, and then I want to speak a little about Ruth Talbra, who had lived here for nine years, and an incredible woman that was here that is totally forgotten today as far as I can tell. At least I've never met anybody who knew her. I have a hard time of going back and forth by saying Big Ole and calling him by his name or saying him or it or what. And if you go through 20, 30 years of newspapers, this town has made the whistle into a personality. And it's just incredible because even in the newspapers, it's Big Ole. It's not that big whistle or anything. I mean, he, he has, and, and there's stories. It's, it's crazy. It's like the town turned this into a living entity. And when I was talking to older people back 20, 25 years ago, I mean, I'm talking to teary-eyed, you know, remembrances. I mean, it was just really amazing. So Big Ole, 1899, came out of a foundry down in uh, Fairhaven. And this is the image of, a, of the foundry where he would have come awaken in, and he's looking down and trembling, and where am I and what am I? Uh, for the first 13 years, uh, Big Ole actually belonged to the uh, Bellingham Bay Improvement Company, which is just in, uh, you know, just a little south of the Cornwall dark dock area, um, you know, in the northern part of the, of the uh, Boulevard Park. And this is where he perched for, for many years, doing his diligence and his job. There are not a lot of photos of Big Ole. I mean, who would be going around taking pictures of a mill whistle? So in order you know, to find a few of them, I consider it very, very lucky. Um, so Big Ole was six feet long, made of aluminum and bronze. He weighed uh, 1,300 pounds and had a tensile strength of 60,000 pounds per square inch. Needless to say, he was very, very, very loud. Um, I've read reports where you could hear him very well the other side of Lake Wacom. Um, Blummy Island on a good day, uh, Ferndale, and if the, the wind was just right and there was no other noise, you could actually hear the muffle of Big Ole as far away as Blaine. That's what I read anyways. Uh, but this is what he would have looked like on his perch, and obviously in this one he doesn't have a mouth and eyes. <laughs> And then uh, about 1913, uh, uh, the mill was, was bought up by Blodow Donovan, and uh, this is the, the, uh, blo uh, the cargo mill, Blodow Donovan cargo mill that was at the foot of Cornwall. That's where it would have been. And for, um, from 1913 uh, uh, through to 1942, is, this is where his new nesting place was. And it wasn't alone. There was uh, several working uh, mills right here on the bay. You can imagine what it looked like. It would have just been very smoke covered for sure. This is the inside of the cargo mill that he was actually in the offices uh, building just uh, a little bit south and overlooking this building. Notice all the, the sawdust and they were making boxes and I'm not sure what else in this mill. Another shot, obviously not OSHA approved. <laughs> and look at the size of these uh, timbers coming out of, the, uh, out of the, the mills down there. And here you can see 51 feet long, 60 feet, and this is 60 over here as well. This one above it says 100, the one that the kid's sitting on. And like I said, there wasn't just like stories, for no reason, there's these little snippets I'm finding all, to, all the time in the newspapers. Uh, it was a very loud whistle as I said, and actually I'm going to go back really quick and just show you, you will notice that there's uh, three other whistles. I forgot to point this out. Uh, there was probably 40, 50 whistles of various purposes all around. I mean all the mills had a whistle, not as big as Big Ole. 
you'll have mills that obviously in this one here, these little ones could have been break time or whatever, or maybe there was a fire at the mill and maybe one of the other uh, whistles would go off. You know, PAF had their whistles and uh, there was all these shipyards along the bay. So all this is actually also a timepiece. Big Ole, well, that went off at seven, I believe noon, one, six o'clock at quitting time, celebrations, and all these other uh, reasons. I even found newspaper stories saying, today is uh, doc manager so-and-so's birthday, and at two o'clock, don't be alarmed when you hear, hear Big Ole go off. I mean, I guess any, any reason. I, I know the, the, the images and the growing of the town is gonna be interesting, I'm sure, but instead, look at the trees. Look where they are, look at the height. Look at them here, they're, they're slowly being pushed back, but you know, logging in at the same time, you know, the town's being built. Now the, we see some slashing being burned here. They're going back further. This is like Sea Home Hill up here to the right. But look at the, the, the distance here. Look, look, look how they're, the forests are retreating. Now this, this photo here I thought was, was really fascinating. Uh, this is the epitome, I think, of, of the logging at that time. I mean, they're just burning everything underneath, chopping everything down, and, and these are in areas that you wouldn't have normally have gone. This is like a second sweep when you're doing all the hills and all these little cavern areas that would have been harder to get. And the reason why primarily is because technology has moved up where we're able to use different equipment. Now the trees are receding, getting further back, but look at the size of the log pools now. They're massive. Can you imagine having a motorboat or something go zipping around in the bay and a couple of these things get loose? Look at the lumber piling up. And there's times of bus and there's times when, when uh, there's a, a lot of profit being made. I did find a correspondence uh, letter to uh, manager Hyatt who was in San Francisco on the time. And there was images in the paper of lumber just like this, and he was telling uh, the, the home office that the price of moving lumber was so expensive that it wasn't worth leaving the dock. And he indicated a letters weeks later that it's just rotting on the docks, let it. Another little article uh, about Oli here, and uh, obviously there was a strike that ended. Now, here's another little progression of photos. So this is right around Ole's time. I mean, this is the equipment that was pretty much standard, the old buck saw and the ax. And Ole would have heard, or in the book he does, the workers saying, there is so much trees, it'll last forever. And everybody thought so. And when you're using equipment like this, it's pretty obvious that, yeah, you would almost think, you know, you're only taking down so many trees a day. But the one thing you can say is these are really proud, proud men. So at one point, uh, right around 1915, there were 75 shingle mills operating in the county. Makes big noise like work. And here's his buddy, the oxen, who slowly kind of uh, make room later on for the horses. Uh, I read one article, I believe it was in uh, Donald Clark's uh, 18 Men and a Horse, that uh, it was cheaper to feed the horses, and they ate less. Maybe that was the case, I don't know. The guy up front here is kind of interesting, holding the, the, pole, the pole there, he's a grease monkey, and he's, he's greasing the skids so that the logs can go over the skids easier. And, of course, we don't need horses and oxen anymore. By the end of the First World War, trucks that are really sturdy are available now. And plus, they can build them in areas, the bridges and stuff, where they can go they can, couldn't go before. I kind of like this image. I had to plug this one in. And the little train, I mean, the train that, uh, in the eight, I think, I believe it was 1893, that went out towards... Uh, Sumas, uh, uh, Sumas and then down to Glacier eventually, we're bringing in uh, logs. This one says uh, 11 feet uh, diameter. Then of course, they're gonna get bigger. They're extracting more. 
This is one of the few photos actually that Sky Homish, but it was such a cool image, I couldn't say no. <laughs> Big Ole joins with other whistles. Uh, and I'm assuming this is either a reopening. I don't know if they're reopening another part of the plant and, uh, and adding additional workers, or is this after uh, they were closed for a while, maybe they had too much surplus. This was the whole article. <laughs> and as technology approve, improves here, steam donker, donkeys are put in, and these can now get into areas that were inaccessible before, mostly hillsides, steep ones. And then in the bay, schooners were coming in from all over the world. I mean, they were coming in from India, Asia, you know, China, Japan, primarily Australia. Uh, there was uh, uh, barks going to uh, South America and Hawaii, Germany. I mean, all over the world. When you're reading the, uh, the, the traffic in the bay at this time, the, you, you get the port uh, traffic every, every Friday and where all the ships are and where they're coming in and the time that they're due, you'll find times when there's, there's four or five uh, schooners, barks that are waiting out in the bay just, just to come in, just to load up. Loading process was a little slower back then. Here's the Commodore probably going to Hawaii. And of course, even that gives way and we have more of the age of steel hold ships. And as Ole would have said, it puffs out more smoke than me. Poems, even poems are being done. There was several contests during the 30s of poems about Big Ole. And uh, I think you won like a, a, a subscription for the, for the winner. Here's another one. If we had more time, I'd read it. But needless to say, if you kind of go through this, you can even see some of the places, Copenhagen, uh, Zanzibar. And Ole didn't blow just for work, as I was saying. Uh, there's a shot of the Great White Fleet when it was here. Ole would, would blow all the time, and all the other whistles in town would blow. When the First World War was coming on, it was uh, put in the, in, in the paper that uh, if, if uh, Company E at the local uh, uh, armory here was called up, Big Ole would announce them with four long blasts. Uh, interesting enough, I, I had a, a, a great conversation once with uh, David Morse, who remembered vividly when World War I ended, and he and his mother, who, you know, they had a house right on uh, North Garden, right above... Uh, right above where Big Ole was, and they were standing out, and he says, I remember distinctly, he says, they blew Ole uh, until the entire reservoir emptied, and it took 15 minutes. Ships were coming in for visitations in the teens and 20s and 30s, and Ole would be the one who announced them. They had lookouts watching for the ships coming up, and then they would blast them, the whistle, and everybody would come out and, and greet the, the Navy coming in. 1932, I think it was, the airship Akron flew over, and uh, they had all these watchers, and as soon as they, they spotted the airship, Ole blew, all the other whistles blew, everybody kicked all the customers out, and they locked their doors, and the whole streets were full for a while because the airship was only going to be flying over for about 15, 20 minutes, and then it was going to be gone. Well, of course, like any other mill, one of the dangers is fire. And if you, you, know, if you saw the, the images here of how the box mill looked, well, the box mill did go up, uh, the cargo mill, I mean, in uh, 1924, one September uh, day. That's covered in the Oli book. He was really afraid here. He thought he was going to melt. Um, the, 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 mill was, uh, the box mill was uh, uh, rebuilt. Uh, but at this point in time, it was pretty obvious to all that the industry was slowing down. By the end of the 20s, there was were literally running out of forests large enough to really gain a profit off from. I'll give you an idea, in uh, 1912, there was uh, uh, 75 million board feet per year were, were coming out of the, of, the, uh, of the county. By the 1920s, 340 uh, million board feet were coming out. And with that much extraction, they were certainly running out. And then, of course, the uh, Great Depression hit. That didn't help matters. 
at, at this point, um, a lot of the timber, a lot of the logs were coming in from Bloedel's uh, properties on the Olympic Peninsula. And they were bringing in by tender, you know, big log floats to uh, be put through the mill. We were running out. So what is Ole going to do? And he's looking around and going, there's no more timber. What's going to happen? Well, the first thing that happens is the Second World War comes, and Ole is primed up to be a warning uh, whistle if the Japanese were to attack Bellingham. You never know. But that, even that didn't last. Famous whistle, the throaty voice of Big Ole, he's packed up and takes off for the last time that he knows of in 1942 to uh, Port Alberni. There's a photo of them taking the whistle down. And here's uh, Port Alberni, where he would spend the next 60 years. So let's move it up now. I was doing an exhibit right around 2000, but I was, I was doing a lot of research before that. And all the time, I'm hearing Big Ole, Big Ole, Big Ole. And so I started mentioning Big Ole in the exhibit, and all these people came around, oh, I remember Big Ole, I remember Big Ole, what happened to him, you know? I picked up, uh, again, uh, 18 Men and the Horse, and I, you know, and I already knew what I already knew. I knew that he was in Port Alberni. But, you know, I'm thinking one day was kind of a cold day, and I'm like, what? Ever happened to the whistle? Really, is it still around? Did it end up in a trash heap? Who knows? So I was going to call the I was going to call the mill, but I thought, yeah, you know, if the thing was put in the scrapyard 40 years ago, they're going to go, yeah, 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 you know. And I don't know what you're talking about, kid. It was a big deal here, but was it a big deal there? So I did what every ounce does uh, to me. I called the museum. And I said, you know, we had this great whistle. His name was Big Ole, and he was loud. And he went up there, and, and I could hear the, you know, the tick-tocking in this person's head. Finally, they were like, uh-huh. I'll tell you what, um, if you don't hear from somebody by this afternoon, I'll get a hold of you and, uh, and, and, and see if I have an answer for you. And about a couple hours later, um, Ken, Ken uh, Rufford calls me from the mill at Port Alberti. He says, this is this Todd Worger? And I'm like, yeah. And he says, I'm the plant manager. You asked about Big Ole. And I says, yeah, he was a big deal here. And da, da, da. And he goes, well, we call him Big Ole too. We've always called him Big Ole. And he says, he's a big deal here. And he's up right on the roof above my head. And he says, we've been, we switched to electronic whistles. We haven't used them in a, several years. Do you want them? And I was like, I didn't even tell anybody. I'm like, yes, we want them. <laughs> and so they actually rehooked it up so everybody could hear it again. Unfortunately for us, uh, they did not heed the warnings of Bellingham in 1942 when we said, do not put the whistle near windows and offices and the such. And as soon as they gave it a full blast, they blew out windows all over the place. But instead of moving Ole, they cut a foot off from him. And so we really don't know today what Ole looks like. I mean, sounds like, I should say. And here he is when he came back. And fortunately, uh, I brought him back. He sat out back here at the museum for about a year. And then one day, uh, Corky Smith and his friend Dave Franklin came by, and they said, we're from the Sunrise Rotary. Let's get this thing going. Air compressors didn't work. Cogent plant, we brought it down there. They just got the thing started. They got the piping put in. They sold the plant down there, and they wanted it out. And miraculously, and luckily for me, Western University calls, saves the day, and says, we want that whistle on the steam plant. We'll restore it, we'll clean it up, and we'll get it all going again, and it's in use up there today. Now, uh, I'm going to try to wrap this up here quick, because I want to say something about Ruth. I love Ruth's story. Somebody brought me her little book uh, that wasn't published, and she, they brought it to me, and I looked at it, and I said, it's a cute story. I love this story. Jeez, it would be great to edit this thing down and, and change some things and so that we could add on what happened to it. The whistle came back. And it was one of those things, well, I did research and I discovered that she moved to Hawaii and then I found uh, two of her sons by name and tried to contact them. Couldn't contact them. And I noticed then later on, I found an, uh, an obit about uh, Ruth finally. And um, I see there was a minister who 
gave you know the rights and everything and I contacted him and he says oh yes I know the family he says I will contact them and here's an address you contact them so I do that year goes by nothing finally one day I get an email and Joseph the son gets a hold of me and says you were never going to get a hold of my brother because since 9-11, he's been in the Secret Service or something, and nobody talks to him, not even me. And he says, you haven't gotten a hold of me because I'm a marine biologist, and I have been on a secluded island for two years. <laughs> he remembers living here. He remembers stories about Big Ole. He was thrilled about this book, didn't know his mother had it, and he's like, for God's sakes, do everything and anything you can to get this out there for people. Do whatever you want. This is Ruth here, uh, is, is somebody that you ought, really ought to know. She was born in 1921 in Buffalo, New York, and she met her husband at the University of New York in Buffalo, and uh, he was uh, gonna be a medical doctor. She was a teacher, and at the end of World War II, she taught a lot of refugees that came over, and primarily she worked with a lot with the Polish uh, coming over and trying to get jobs in factories, and she started writing this book Pulaski's Place, which turned out to be a, a pretty good, uh, you know, it, it got out there nationally. And um, I said, so Joseph, why Bellingham? Why did they come here? And he says to me, because it was Buffalo. Needless to say, do I need to say more? He goes, you ever had a winter in Buffalo? And he says, my father had enough, and he had to do a residency somewhere, and they wanted to move out here. And he says, the only place that accepted him for his residency was North Dakota in the winter. He goes, mom said, no way. She took the kids, came out. They eventually found a place up here in, in Bellingham. And about 1947, they moved here. They got a house on Lake Wacom. He opened up a family practice. He loved boating. And after a while, he finally got a boat and on the lake. And he says, I remember just like yesterday, he goes, the 50s, anybody he says you talked to back there who lived in Bellingham in the 50s remembers the lousy weather. We had horrible winters and raining, rainy summers. He goes, 55 goes by, my dad's looking out the window, and it rained and rained and rained, and he's watching his boat bobbing up and down. He goes, a second summer, for four months it rained. He goes, my dad's looking out the window one day, and he's, he says, I remember it. He goes, just like he was alive today. He throws up his hands, and he says, enough. I'm done. So the next day, he flew, flies down to California to try to find a job, can't find one, comes back, and he has a stopover in San Francisco where he meets this guy who says, I'm with the sugar plantations and, uh, in Hawaii, and we need doctors. A week later, they were living down there. So I'm going <laughs> to wrapping this up. Uh, this is an image of, of she's all the way over here to your left. In Hawaii, she comes into her, her, her being. Uh, Ruth ends up writing heavily on Hawaiian history, um, folklore, children's books, uh, Asian books, and she becomes uh, a, a, called a living legend by the governor and was awarded all kinds of uh, awards for that. Here she is one more time here with another book of hers about the world's tallest Christmas tree. Uh, at the time that I was bringing the whistle back in uh, 2004, she was 83 and passed away right about the time the whistle showed up. Needless to say, when I gave Joe a copy of the book, he said that I can't tell where his mother's writing stopped and ours began. Thank you. Wow, wasn't that a great story about Ruth? What I want to do uh, for people that uh, I go and uh, speak in front of is I want to change their perspective. And so I have blown up the cover of the book. The cover was done by Steve Mayo, our wonderful local marine artist, and it's called Native View of families uh, going about their business on a day and suddenly this ship arrives in Bellingham Bay, way out there in the background. So what I write about is a piece of our hidden history here. The uh, other community mothers who got left out of what was written. Uh, what we've always heard about is uh, about five very nice white ladies who came here, and they kind of got all the print. Uh, 
But in fact, for the first 20 years of Whatcom County's legal existence, about 90% of all the married couples here were cross-cultural couples. And yet these women uh, did not appear in our histories. Um, I was told in the beginning there was nothing to know, nothing to find. It would be a very hard subject. Um, and it started out to be just a two-year local history project, and it just kind of ballooned out of there. Uh, there's an old saying, historians are always surprised that their subject waited for them. And as I got further into this subject, uh, it, it ended up taking so long because as it turns out, uh, almost no one in the United States has ever bothered to try to write biographies of Native, Native American women, who we could call ordinary women, uh, of the 1850s and beyond. All we have ever heard about is Pocahontas, Sacagawea, maybe Sarah Winnemucca, but not ordinary women who helped to build their communities. So that what I found was that there was not so little out there to find, it was that there was so much, but no one had ever bothered to look for it before. So uh, I ended up having to cut the research off when I thought all my questions were pretty much answered, but I had lists and lists of sources still to be consulted um, because there was just a lot more out there. So I'm going to do uh, a little reading um, for you too here. Mary, a Coast Salish woman, slept beside her second husband, Chief Henry Quina, in the darkness of a December morning in 1890 on Lummi Reservation in the northwest corner of Washington State. Not far away, her daughter Teresa Forsyth Finkbonner along with her husband and five children, slumbered before the sunrise would wake them. A thousand miles east at Wounded Knee Creek in South Dakota, Colonel James Forsyth stood on a rise in the frigid winter morning and watched as fire from four Hotchkiss mountain guns raked across the teepees of exhausted Sioux families below. It cut to pieces starving men, women, and children Terrified mothers ran and crawled away with their little ones to seek shelter in ravines where scores died of wounds or froze to death in the following hours. When past historians scrutinized Forsyth's actions, their assessment of his character would have been better informed and perhaps more nuanced had they known about Mary and Teresa, his daughter. The abandonment of his first family remained hidden for more than a century except to Mary's descendants and local residents. So there is a, a context to be had here of the marriages here and why we had all these marriages. Um, and I'm gonna kinda go through that. Each of the biographies that are in this book are constructed in the same way. First it's her history, then his history, their histories together, and then their legacy. And that's my main goal here, is to show that these women did not just exist and disappear, they all left legacies here for us in Whatcom County. Cross-cultural marriages began as soon as the Spanish hit the sands of the New World. Some of these were forced, some of these were uh, voluntary, some of them lasted a brief, period of time, some of them were lifelong uh, intermarriages. In the 1700s, Thomas Jefferson and some friends of his proposed that the only way we would ever have an American ethnicity would be if the uh, Euro-Americans who were here, the, the colonists, would marry with the Indians. That did not work out well. Uh, <clears throat> the white people uh, did not want to adopt anything from the Indians except uh, corn and squash and things like that. The native people very quickly saw that no matter how white they became, 
they would never be treated as equals. And so many of the uh, early rebellions in this country that you read about in your high school history textbook, uh, rebellions of the Indians, most of them were led not by native men, they were led by the sons of cross-cultural marriages. That included corn planter of the Seneca, Joseph Brandt of the Mohawk, Alex McGillivray of the Creek, and Osceola of the Seminoles. As we pushed further over the Appalachians, uh, what the Americans found was it wasn't an empty wilderness at all. The French were out there, and uh, many of them, if not most, were intermarried. So that we think that Americans founded all these major cities out there, but in fact they did not. These cities already existed when the Americans got there. St. Louis, Detroit, Chicago, Kaskaska, Illinois, Green Bay, Wisconsin, Prairie du Chien, Arkansas Post on the lower Mississippi. Um, once we moved into the Southwest, we found established towns at San Antonio and Santa Fe that were also cross-culturally uh, couples had um, started those. As the wagon roads opened and we pushed further into the west, all these small towns that are, have been established now, they decide to write their histories. And when they write their histories, they kind of take out all of those founders, those cross-cultural people that founded. And instead, what we get is a history that says the first white woman in town and the first white baby born. And those are always tip-offs that there were other people living there before, uh, and they've just been written out. So we end up with the myth of the pioneer woman, as it's been written. She was a courageous, sad-eyed wife or widow who left her home forever and walked beside a covered wagon across the continent to settle in a wilderness that with her womanly efforts became a real community. Or she was half of an improbable love story, the mail order bride who braved the ocean's dangers to marry a virtual stranger and with him build a community. Or she was the school marm who brought culture to a dusty town. Perhaps she never married and dedicated her life to the town's children. Or she was the business-minded, satin and lace-clad saloon girl with a heart of gold whose for sale femininity kept a settlement in the wilderness from devolving into violence and lawlessness until real ladies arrived. Anyone ever watch Gunsmoke? <laughs> yes, remember Kitty and her girls and nothing, you know, bad went on. They just wore a lot of satin and lace and danced. So... Um, and standing pugnaciously alone were Calamity Jane and Annie Oakley, the symbols of fierce femininity equal to men in the face of the West's challenges. Not memorialized were the young indigenous women who lived where forts were built and settlers staked claims that displaced native communities. High-born native daughters, sometimes wed army officers, merchants, and local officials, whom the families considered of equal social status. The women played their own roles on a frontier that was cultural, not geographic. So, uh, when the settlers then get to the Northwest, um, I know that you all know the Hudson Bay Company was out here, although they were not in Whatcom County, except as uh, when San Juan Islands were part of Whatcom County. But the settlers come over the Oregon Trail, and we are given this view that they end up in this empty Eden that is the Willamette Valley, and just waiting for them to settle it and bring civilization. Not exactly true. Uh, when they arrived in Oregon, St. Paul, the town of St. Paul, was busy erecting their new brick church, and it was a town of retired Hudson Bay Company employees, and they had the first brick building north of San Francisco. 
Um, the other myth we get is the Whitmans, and um, Narcissa Whitman, uh, who's always sitting on top of her hill, looking down the trail, hoping for someone to come because she's so lonely. Well, the truth is that right down the hill from Narcissa was a Cayuse Indian village uh, that they were working on, um, that they were proselytizing and converting. Those women could have been her friends, but she didn't want to be friends with native women. Often the other distance, only about a mile away, was the community of Frenchtown, and there were 60 to 100 families on scattered cabins uh, on farms that were retired Hudson Bay Company people. The women spoke French, uh, they were all native, but to Narcissa, they were native women, so she wasn't interested in them, and oh my God, they were Catholics. So she, she puts out this myth that she's all alone and lonely, when in truth she could have had many friends. As we get into Washington, then generally where the Hudson Bay Company was in Washington, you get these blended communities. So uh, the towns in Washington that were founded by cross-cultural couples, you get uh, where Fort Vancouver was, Walla Walla, Chewila, Kettle Falls, Okanagan, Spokane, Missoula, Montana, um, and then large colonies down uh, along the Cowlitz and Nisqually rivers. So in December of 1852, Henry Roeder and Russell Peabody come to Bellingham Bay uh, where they have uh, heard about this waterfall here that will be suitable for a small mill. They uh, go to Lummi where uh, one of the leaders at Lummi gives them permission to use it. However, he was not the wisest leader at Lummi. He was kind of what they call the mouthpiece out there. And the wisest man, Salik, was, uh, we believe, ill that day. And, and because if he'd been there, he probably would not have given them permission to come here. And they, this guy had the uh, impression that they were going to use the waterfall like the Hudson Bay Company would come in and out of places. They did not see it as they were turning it over permanently to Peabody. Uh, Roeder and Peabody both married Native women, and if you've never heard that Roeder had a Native woman, a Native wife before, it's probably because it was a secret that was kept for 150 years. And um, Howard Buswell, our local historian here, who died before he could write after he collected things for 40 years, uh, I started finding in his materials someone named Captain Vermilion, and I, who is Captain Vermilion? I don't know of anybody around here named Captain Vermilion. And then one day it hit me. Rotor was from Vermilion, Ohio. But Howard was so afraid of the family's continued power here in Bellingham that he coded everything, and he had eyewitnesses and children of eyewitnesses for the accounts of this marriage um, that occurred. He, um, he and um, his uh, native wife, who we don't have her name, uh, they had two children together. And when he heard that Elizabeth was on her way from Ohio, he sent her and the children back to Lummi Reservation, where I have two different versions. One is that they all died, and the other is I think I know who she was, uh, but I can't prove it. And she did live a long life, but I, I can't prove that. So uh, between 1853 and 1858, we get four waves of bachelors into Bellingham Bay, which is different from almost anywhere else in uh, western Washington. Uh, we get the men who come here to work on the mill, and that includes John Tennant, who came up, and, and Thomas Wynn, and of course, uh, the Eldridges, who you all know about. Uh, so we've got some bachelors there. The next year, the coal mine starts, and we get a whole bunch more bachelors come in. Two years later, the army arrives to protect the Lummi and the Samish and uh, the settlers here against the northern raiders. So we get more bachelors. 
And two years after that, we get the Fraser River Gold Rush when we had the 10,000 guys camped on the beach all summer long. From all four of those groups, at least some men decided to stay here. Uh, the gold miners decide, most of them were from California, and they'd figured out that, yeah, they probably weren't going home with a million dollars to be the governor of Illinois. It wasn't going to happen, so um, they decide to settle down. There are almost zero marriageable white girls here. There are babies, but there are no young unmarried women at all. And so if you're going to settle down, then you're going to marry a neighborhood girl. And that's what they all did. They married the girls from Lummi and Swinomish and Samish and Semiamu, <clears throat> and some from uh, Nooksack. Uh, what we're presented with when cross-cultural marriages are discussed is that it's kind of a one-sided thing. He goes out and gets this girl. Um, because he needs a housekeeper, and uh, he needs a sex partner, and he needs a cook. Nobody ever looks at the other side of the equation. And all of these young women here, uh, their parents had their own agendas, because an al a marriage alliance was in their culture, and it brought economic advantages, it brought military advantages, political advantages, um, and so they, the men may have sort of chosen the women, but the fathers were also choosing those men. So you see the men that are army officers, um, county officials here, or uh, Fitzhugh, the mine manager, they're marrying very upper class girls whose fathers see those men as of the proper social status. And one uh, really big advantage here is that in Coast Salish culture, you always marry outside your own village. And so most of the daughters would marry 100 miles from home, maybe more, would only see their families once or twice a year at a big potlatch or some other gathering. When they married these guys, the girls were very, very close to home and could still be with their families. So I actually wrote eight biographies. But once I submitted this, it was going to be a 500-page book. And uh, WSU Press wanted it right away, but they didn't ever want to publish 500 pages. So they made me cut it in half. So I chose uh, four of those biographies that I thought fit well together. So Caroline Davis Kavanaugh married to fulfill her father's agenda to keep peace among the alien peoples who shared geographical space. Her tenacity allowed her family to keep part of her own Samish family's traditional inherited land. And her chapter begins like this. Caroline Kavanaugh, one of Skagit County's founding mothers, walked slowly along the six miles of country road between Swinomish Reservation's Catholic Church and her aged cedar cabin on Shaysquil, now called March Point. Caroline's brown skin was deeply wrinkled, but her eyes still shone. She had spent nearly her entire life on the three-mile-long peninsula south of Bellingham Bay, her homeland, her Illahi. Shaysquil held the story of her childhood, most of her married life with two men, and 30 years of widowhood. In the distance, she saw a motorcycle roaring toward her, dust clouds billowing. The young rider easily recognized the tiny, tiny woman whose long, wavy hair reached almost to the ground when it wasn't in her usual braid. Even in old age, her lifelong pride was still not fully gray. U.S. Navy sailor Lyman Kavanaugh braked his new machine to a dusty halt and greeted his beloved grandmother. He kidded the famously independent woman, Grandma, don't you want to ride? Everyone knew how Caroline would bristle and reject offers of assistance. The little woman surprised her grandson when she gathered her long skirt and climbed up behind him without hesitation. Caroline relished her ride home hair flowing behind, brushed by the wind. 
Caroline's first husband was Lieutenant Robert Hugh Davis, nephew of Jefferson Davis, the Secretary of War. And they had a son here, and he was forced to go home for the Civil War. Didn't want to, didn't plan on it. They already had a land claim that they were developing when he was forced to go home. Her second husband was Sheriff James Cavanaugh, a very literate Irish um, immigrant, and um, they had two sons together. Mary Fitzhugh Lear Phillips lived her life in accordance with the Sklalem people's self-identification of the strong people. Her resilience and survival skills enabled her descendants to become leaders in a new century. And Mary's chapter begins like this. The springless wagon creaked and moaned through muddy ruts and over rocks in the crude approach road to Washington Territory's new prison. Rough-looking men in dirty suits and dirtier boots swung the gates open and the wagon rolled through the unfinished stockade that smelled of newly cut logs. The horses halted before the two-story prison building whose glassless windows stared at the wagon's occupants. Mary Phillips struggled down from the wagon, hampered by iron manacles. Convicted of killing her alcoholic and abusive fourth husband on Christmas Day nine months earlier, she would call the prison home for the next two years. Though the prison can find no other women prisoners, nor had even a single female guard, Mary was not alone. Also in the wagon were Mary's infant son, and three-year-old daughter. Prison records called the little ones boarders, but in fact, they would also be prisoners in the brutal institution. Mary's first husband was uh, E.C. Fitzhugh, the mine manager, and uh, he became territorial Supreme Court justice while uh, she was married to him. Uh, I hope to write a book about him yes, uh, someday because he's really fascinating. He's, he was nominated and confirmed for the uh, court while under indictment for murder. Mary's second husband was William King Lear and uh, he was with the army as a settler when he arrived here. Uh, was an, kind of an entrepreneur um, and after she had a son with him, he left her and went to Alaska where he became one of the founders of Wrangell, the town of Wrangell. And, um, oh, her very first husband was a native man and she had a child and they died in an epidemic, I believe. So Fitzy was the second, then Lear, and then the fourth husband was an uh, illiterate Welsh a uh, lime kiln worker out on Orcas Island that um, she shot. Okay. Clara Tennant Selhamitam helped to build new communities through church building. She exhibited leadership that took her family's values of service and obligation into a blended culture without losing her own identity. Hang on just a second. Clara and Reverend John Tennant climbed into a large cedar canoe at the crossing, site of the Nooksack Methodist Mission at today's Everson, Washington. Nooksack headman Lyndon Jim Selhamatum Yellowkinum captained the eight man crew who would take them, two other ministers, and his own family downriver after the Methodist camp meeting. The canoe ran low and heavy. Though melting Mount Baker snow filled the Nooksack River almost to the top of its banks, the tenant's journey was pleasant. The river's currents, logs, root balls, and boulders always lurked in new spots, but the Nooksack people had canoed the river for centuries. Near Jim's village and the young town of Linden, 
They fought through the narrow channel at century-old Devil's Bend log jam. They fiercely pulled through the large whirlpool beyond, but on that day, an enormous snag lodged across the current could not be seen beneath the swift water's surface just past the maelstrom. The canoe's prow ran up on the submerged log and lurched high out of the water. The men struggled to control the craft whose stern caught in the whirlpool, but it swung over the middle of the roiling water. Caught, the canoe turned until its full length struck the log. It split in two. The passengers screamed as the wounded canoe tilted up, turned back, and capsized. Everyone went into the glacial water. The whirlpool sucked passengers in the stern underwater and carried them choking downstream. Clara and John clung to one half of the drifting canoe. When he spotted a snag floating in an eddy, he shoved Clara toward it. She clung to the log, but her heavy clothes dragged her deeper into the frigid water. The Nooksack crew had reached the bank, but several jumped back in to rescue her. John fought the current until he grabbed another snag far downstream. Linda and Jim and his granddaughter surfaced, flung together across the submerged log. He held tightly to the little girl, but the relentless river tore her away and left him holding only a piece of her dress. Her mother, Mariah, struggled ashore with the baby but went back into the river for hours, searching for her lost daughter. Hypothermic, exhausted, and frantic with grief when they found the girl's body under a drift of logs, Mariah did not long survive. The Nooksacks, tenants, and others mourned the victims in the Selhamaton longhouse. So Claire's first husband is, of course, John Tennant, Tennant Lake. He held pretty much every elected office you could have in this county, belonged to every organization. He had the best farm. He was an incredible man, kind of a Renaissance man. Um, and um, she learned to be a farmer's wife and to hold down the place while he climbed. He was on the first group that climbed Mount Baker, so she was at home holding down the farm. And then uh, he reconverted back to his Methodist faith. He was the son of one of the most famous Methodist uh, missionaries to ever live in the United States in Arkansas. And uh, he had left the faith when he went to California, like most of the guys. But he reconverted back, and they then became missionaries. They uh, built the church on Orcas Island. They built the Ferndale Church. They built the Linden Church. Much of it was built, uh, that Linden Church was, and the Ferndale Church were built with uh, the tenants' own money because they were very prosperous. Um, and after he died, she nursed him through three strokes. After he died, uh, and she was a widow for 10 years, she married Lyndon Jim, who she had known since childhood. And the last one is uh, Nellie Carr Lane, personified the community mother. Through her own actions and those of hundreds of descendants, she contributed to Lummi Island's community development and Lummi Nation's future. So her chapter's called Nellie, an American Family. Jim Carr was dying. With every labored breath, he knew the pneumonia would not be defeated. The fever would not break. The chills would not cease. The coughing would not stop. He was going to die, and his two young Stalo wife, Nellie, and their baby would be alone in the cabin. What happened next became family legend. The dying man told Nellie to get his horse and hurry to Sheriff Fred Lane. Go get my friend. I want to see him before I die. I want to tell him something. Lane's land claim adjoined cars, but the sheriff was often miles away in town, sometimes in the islands. She thought Lane had taken the canoe to his place in town, but she ran down to where she saw his horse, horse tethered. Lane was still there and saw Nellie's distressed face. When he asked what was wrong, she gave him Carr's message. Back at the cabin, Carr told Lane that he was dying and said, I want you to take good care of my wife and baby. 
Helene Nellie Carr had no local family. To return to her mother near the Fraser River demanded that she find someone to canoe her upriver to Squahalich, then find a Nooksack escort to take her up the trail into Stalo country. The trip would take days and it was early 1867. The weather veered from clear and cold to snow and rain. The Arctic winds that funneled down the river to the prairies might come at any time. It was too early in the year for such an arduous journey with a baby. The too young wife became a too young widow. F.F. Lane did not take her home to her family. No one did. Lane married her instead. Uh, Nellie's first husband was a shipwright from New York who came here uh, and was uh, actually the first settler down on March Point, but it, uh, they left very quickly. It wasn't very friendly down there. And um, he ended up uh, working at the mill for a long time in the mine and, <clears throat> and then settled out there uh, on the Nooksack River uh, with Nellie, and then he died. And so she married the sheriff. And Fred Lane was from a very famous... Uh, seafaring family in Massachusetts. His father was one of those guys that sailed the fully rigged giant ships of the day all the way around the world trading. At one time, Fred was in China for two years as the company's clerk there. Um, very uh, interesting family. Here he became sheriff, he became superintendent of schools. He and Nellie had like 12 kids and became the second family on uh, Lummi Island. Uh, eventually, Lummi, or Nellie became a uh, entrepreneur. She uh, produced very high quality uh, yarn balls and socks for the fair department store here in Bellingham. And she also ran a navigational light out there. Um, Mary, uh, Mary Fitzhugh Lear Phillips and Nellie Carlane are, are both ancestors of today's traditional chief of the Lummi, uh, Bill James, who's now known as Salik. And uh, there are about 400 lanes there and here in town. And if you follow sports and see Treasy Lane was picked as uh, one of the two most valuable uh, Native American basketball players. Uh, in this country this past year, and now he's playing for the Whatcom uh, Community College team and was just instrumental in a big victory that they had. So they are leaders in many, many fields. So uh, how am I doing? I need to stop. Okay, let me just say this. The other four biographies are in the works. My manuscript is due on February 1st, um, and that will be... Jenny and Tom Wynn, the Quaker, uh, Mary and Solomon Allen, who founded Marietta, uh, Elizabeth and James Patterson, who were the first people at what became Linden, and Mrs. George Pickett and their son. Thank you. On the fringes of this book, is there any evidence of indigenous men and settler women in combination? and? Any sense of what happened when Yes, happened? but not here. I can't find any, in, at least in that first generation. Uh, the Allen son, who I will be writing about, so uh, half indigenous in the next book, uh, the two sons go back to Illinois to go to school, and both of them marry non-indigenous women. No, it's not, not, I couldn't find any like that at all because there weren't a lot of marriageable girls here. Most of the women that were here, they came here as married women that were not indigenous, yeah. So Candace, you know, I, I purchased your book, this is Anna Booker, and I have now assigned it to one of my classes. So you just made 35 sales, <laughs> you'll be happy to know. Um, and, but I had a question. You said that Whatcom was different yeah. from other smaller cities, I'm assuming, here in Washington that were settled 
yeah. as it, when Washington was still a territory, but that Wacom had this unique history, and I'm wondering yeah, why that Yeah, I say that, that be. because either they were founded by Hudson Bay Company families, or they, they had more marriageable girls come, uh, like Whidbey Island, Coopville, and that area. There's, there's very few cross-cultural marriages over on Whidbey Island uh, and in most other places. Uh, however, that being said, people are still contacting me now and saying, oh, did you work on this couple? And I'm like, oh, never heard of that one. So the files just kind of keep growing. Uh, Henry Yesler of Seattle, uh, who was one of the founders, he had an indigenous wife uh, when he came to Seattle and uh, th his daughter with her became kind of a grand dame over at Port Townsend and I know their uh, descendants. Yeah, so, okay. so, so but it was, Bellingham is just, seems to be rather unique in that you had that huge influx of bachelors in those four waves that didn't happen in these other places. There'd be people dribbling in, but not a cause for, for those big groups to come and then decide to settle and marry a neighborhood girl. I am intrigued about what has caused both of you to be interested in history? What was the trigger point for you that that gave you the impetus and the power and the strength to carry forward at this level. Go ahead. What got you interested in steam whistle? Well, I can. I'll give you the honest truth for that one. I, <laughs> I was a geology major and a science major. I excelled brilliantly. I think I was horrible in math. I I couldn't even add on my fingers. History was just a hobby. It was the only other choice. <laughs> but I made it work. I mean, it, it, it's a field where you, there, I mean, if you didn't go into the teaching prof profession or, or if you didn't, um, you know, if you didn't do local history, which, I, which is, seems to be a lot of what I do, I mean, you would have to go to where the jobs are. And, you know, I, I kind of worked it with archives, records management, and then museum. Um, and so with a combination thereof, I just kind of learned how to use, I, I think that the, the biggest thing, and I think Candace would agree, is once you learn how to use archives, records, how to try to find things, locate things, because those are areas that you're on your own. And once you do that, it's like entering another dimension. I mean, there's things out there that you have no clue uh, exist because somebody wrote it and it was put somewhere and it could be sitting there for a hundred years before you pick it up. Well, mine started because I was a volunteer at the State Archives here for 15 years. And at lunch hour, I'd go in and read collections, especially Howard Buswell's. Uh, who, whose material is in the Center for Pacific Northwest Studies, and he collected stuff for 40 years, and he interviewed in the 1940s uh, Lummi people and stuff, and then he'd run home and he'd type it all up and put a date on it and everything, and it was stuff that, and then he died before he ever wrote anything. And so it's just sitting there. And um, one day, a, a woman came in, and I was running the desk, and she said, hi, she said, um, I have a great-great-grandmother, her name was Mary, she was an Indian, and she married a guy here, and that's all we know about her, can you help me find my family? And I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting, so we went looking in the stuff, and I found a marriage record for them. Six weeks later, another woman walks in. Same, almost said exactly the same thing. And when we went into the marriage records, it turned out that her couple and the first woman's couple had been married together on one day, the Barretts and the Briggs. And so then I got more interested in this and I started looking at Howard Buswell had a list of the marriages that he knew about and it kind of started percolating, but I didn't think I could ever write anything. Um, but then a, a newspaper writer in Washington, D.C. was referred to me for help. And she was writing a full page article on the second Mrs. Pickett and Jimmy pick it. And it was to go in the Washington Times at the time that they were reburying the third Mrs. Pickett or something. And what I told Martha was on the phone, I said, 
uh, everything that could be found out about Mrs. Pickett has been found out and printed. There isn't anything else. And she said to me, would you please suspend that assumption and look again? And when I did, here we are, we're 50 years after the first material is done and we have a lot of new stuff available and ways to get at it. And of course I started finding new stuff immediately. So then I said, faith, fatally, well, what else is out there about these women who lived here that everybody says there's nothing to be found? Is there something to be found? And I was off and running. It was supposed to be a two-year project, and it just, I kept finding more and more stuff. I'm a, I'm a person who follows paper trails, so I disassemble, if there's a paragraph in Leela Jackson Edson's book, uh, I disassemble that paragraph, and every single noun that's in there, I'm going to research. So if you said you went to Yale, I'm going to get hold of Yale and ask if you went there, that kind of stuff. Or I'm going to research your hometown. I'm going to find that out. So that's why it took so long. But that was my inspiration, it was sort of accidental. Thank you.